broadcasting on the internet airwaves from the great state of Minnesota. My name is Sean, and you're listening to The Sean Tabbitt Show. Today, my special guest is Chris Vallotton, and we're discussing his new book, Destined to Win, How to Embrace Your God-Given Identity and Realize Your True Kingdom Purpose. And that's published by my good friends over at Thomas Nelson. Chris, thanks for joining us on today's show. Oh, thanks for having me. Very exciting to be on the show. Now, Chris, I've had the pleasure of meeting with you several times over the past couple of years, but I know you're still going to be new to many of our listeners. So to kick off our conversation, tell us a bit of the Chris Valton origin story. And I know you're a huge fan of Batman, so feel free to insert superhero <laughs> references as necessary. <laughs> Batman. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of funny. Well, okay, a little bit about me personally. I've been married for 46 years. I met my wife when she was 12. We got engaged when she was 13. Got married when she was 17. We have four children. Our oldest is adopted. And we had all our biological children by the time she was 21. We were in business for 20 years. We've had nine different businesses. And then we came to Bethel Church, and Bill Johnson brought us to Bethel Church. We've been with Bill for 37 years. He was the pastor, actually 39 years. He was the pastor of our little church in a little town called Weaverville, California. You know, when you're from Weaverville, it doesn't sound like you have much of a (laughs) much of an edumacation. We moved to Redding, California, left the business world to start the School of Ministry here in Redding, California. Started with 37 students. Last year, we graduated 2,401 full-time students from 65 countries, 953 international students. So that's a little bit about me. I've got eight grandkids. Grandkids are much better than children. I would have skipped right to grandkids if I had a chance. We're having a really great time and Just wrote the book, Destined to Win, finished it the beginning of, actually finished it at the end of last year, and just launched the book uh, about two weeks ago. Thanks for giving us a little insight into your background. It's always fun just to hear some of the backstory, to know where you're coming from, to see some of the paths that God has led you in life. And you mentioned Bethel School of Ministry. That's a good lead-in to the next question. In the introduction, you share about how the book attempts to capture some of the most remarkable things that you've learned about calling and purpose over the last two decades running and working with Bethel School of Ministry. Give us the, say, 10,000-foot overview of what BSM is all about, and then talk to us about your teaching on calling and purpose. Is this something that was a part of Bethel Church and BSM culture at the beginning, or is this something that developed organically over time? First of all, BSM, Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry, or Bethel School of Ministry, was really founded on the premise that God actually wants to empower everybody to be fully alive, fully actualized, do the miracles of Jesus, and live a fully actualized life, a fully alive life. And so we've graduated more than 10,000 students in the last 19 years. And the book actually comes from my experience trying to help people or helping people experience life. And, you know, Jesus said, I want to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. I'm like, all right, so what does it actually look like in a person's life? How do people actually know why they're alive? One of the most asked questions, I think, in the world, but obviously in Christian circles and in our school ministry, when we do questions and answers, people ask the question like, Everybody says, I have a purpose. You know, you meet somebody who doesn't know the Lord, and you're like, the Lord has a plan for your life. (laughs) And, you know, the most asked question is, what is it? How do I find the plan? And, you know, our school ministry students, again, the most repeated question in question and answer time is, how do I know what I'm supposed to be doing? How do I actually find my purpose? Once I find my purpose, how do I actually do my purpose? How do I actually get involved in my purpose? And so that inspired the book, really, because I feel like, for instance, Rick Warren's great book, Purpose Driven Life, I read that book. I thought it was really a great book, super simple. And it basically said to the world, to the church, to everybody on the planet, you were born for a purpose. You're not a cosmic burp. You didn't crawl out of the sea as an amoeba and 
evolutionize into an ape and then into a person. You were actually created in the image and likeness of God. Your grandfather is not hanging from some tree someplace in Africa. You have a purpose. But that book inspired people and inspired me. The question is again is how do I find my purpose? And so that's what the book's about. And so I'll give you a, a couple of, if you will, a little a couple of little trailer films of the movie, so to speak. And one of the ways you find your purpose is to find your people. So people are like, How do I find my purpose? Well your purpose is actually in your people because we are called to be a part of something bigger than us. And so I always say to our students, if you have a vision that is not bigger than you, you don't have God's vision because God's vision always includes interdependence, not independence. And for instance, the great apostle Paul gave us an analogy that we are part of a body. And he said in 1 Corinthians, you know, some people are the eye, some people are the hand, the foot, and so on and so forth. And he said, the eye can't say the foot, I have no need of you. In other words, the point is, is that we need each other. Now, if you are metaphorically the hand, it's important that you know the knee. But it's really important that you have a relationship with the arm. Because if you're a hand, you don't have a purpose without the arm. <laughs> the arm, the people you're connected with, actually are the people who actually actualize your destiny. They're actually the people who give you a purpose. So you're like, okay, my gift mix is a hand. I'm a hand. Yes, but your purpose is actually in the arm. You find your purpose in your people. Now, Jim Collins, in his amazing book called Good to Great, actually picked this up. Uh, you know, He picked up a kingdom idea in a business book, in a leadership book. And he said, Business people are always saying, you got to have a vision for your business. you got to have a vision for your organization. And he said, if you get the right people on the bus and you get them in the right seat, the bus will end up at the right place. In other words, your destiny is in the people on that bus and in finding your place with the people who are on the bus you're supposed to be on. And so the book, I think, does a really unique job something I've never read on any other book or even actually heard anyone else preach. And it basically says, first of all, you know, there's a chapter on your destinies and your people. And then there's two more chapters on how do I actually find my people? Like, how do I know them when I'm with them? How do I know if these are my people? I think it's a new approach to purpose and destiny. And I actually think it's the kingdom where you find purpose. Another section in the book that I found particularly helpful it was where you talk about soul care. Uh, I think people often do a good job of caring for their external body. You know, they think a lot about what people see on the outside, but fail to be intentional about caring for what's on the inside. So talk to us about soul care. How can we really care for our soul and why is that critically important? Well, first John says, beloved, I pray that you'd prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. So prosperity and health are directly related to your soul and indirectly related to your spirit. In many Christian circles, we're taught that if you're going to actually be spiritual, then you have to actually oppress your soul or at least suppress your soul. It's like my feelings don't matter. It's all about the word. It's all about the spirit. And the truth is, is that when I received Jesus Christ, I became a new creation. I didn't just become a new spirit. I became a whole new creation. David said about 20 times in the Psalms, my soul thirsts for you. My soul hungers for you. Statements like that are all through the Psalms that actually the Lord restores my soul. <laughs> so it's important that, first of all, we value our soul. Because if we don't value our soul, then we will have no plan to actually manage our soul. And if we don't manage our soul, then we're getting our soul needs met through reaction instead of proaction. Instead of proactively meeting the needs of my soul, I reactively meet the needs of my soul. For instance, just a couple of needs, just to, obviously the book does a much better job than we're doing here on interview, but one of the things everybody needs is attention. Another need we have a need 
to feel like we belong. We have a need. Our soul needs to feel significant. We want to fit in, but we want to stand out. These are not just wants. These are needs. Like my body needs air. Like my body needs food. My soul actually needs to feel like it belongs. My soul actually needs to feel like someone pays attention to me. I'm not invisible. And so if I just took this one need, my need to be known, my need for attention, if I take that need and I don't proactively say, okay, so how do I get attention in a healthy way? If I don't develop a plan to meet my soul's needs in a healthy way, I become like a starving man who will steal. Proverbs says that a famished man will steal to actually feed his soul. And it goes on to say, to a famished man, any bitter thing seems sweet. So if I'm not feeding my soul, if I'm not actually giving my soul a great diet of proactively getting my needs met in a healthy way, then I become like the person who always needs attention and always stands out in a crowd as the person who says the wrong thing, who is doing stupid stuff all the time, who's maybe body piercings are all, you know, you know, uh, tattoos, you know, all over their body. And I'm not opposed to any of those things. I'm just saying it's a big old flag that says, hey, pay attention to me. We've all seen people with tattoo their entire face and everything that sticks out on them has got a pierce. In my mind, like, that's so sad that people need attention so badly that they actually do whatever it takes to say, listen, I'm not invisible. And so, you know, we spend uh, a half an hour every day in the mirror getting ready on the outside, brushing our hair, putting on makeup, whatever it is we do to look great on the outside. But most of us don't take 20 seconds to figure out how to be beautiful on the inside. So the book has some really good instruction on how do I actually take care of my soul. Next, let's talk about choosing a mentor. That's obviously a critical part of learning, growing, and being stretched. So when we're looking for somebody to act as a wise counselor, what are some of the key values that we should be looking for? That inspires a few comments. The first one is we have to invite somebody in our life that actually has permission to speak into our life. And oftentimes I've been asked so many times, like, I need a father in my life. Would you be a mentor? Would you disciple me? Or some language that says, would you give me input? And then The first time I give them input, they defend themselves. They're like, no, that's not what I meant. I'm like, well, the first thing is, how do I have a father in my life or a mother? Well, I've got to be a son or a daughter. I I actually have to know how to receive input into my life. And so I would say, before I answer the question, how do I choose a mentor? I want to first say, we need to be people who can be mentored. We need to be people who can receive counsel. So the second thing I would say is that we want to find somebody. I think I put it something like this in the book. If I do something, if I was to sin, I want to find somebody that I would be nervous telling in the sense that I really respect them. So if I have a problem with pornography, I don't need a mentor who has a problem with pornography. I don't need them to say, oh, yeah, we've all sinned. Yeah, we all have those issues. Everybody has issues. That's not the kind of mentor I need. I need somebody that is wise, somebody I respect enough that I would go, boy, I need to tell them that I have this issue, but I do feel a little bit anxious because I so care what they think about me. And thirdly, I need to find a mentor who will actually be honest with me, who will encourage me, that will find gold in me, will be a Barnabas or a Mordecai to me, but also has the courage to confront me and tell me the truth about issues in my life. And so I think that's a very special person. We have to remember that accountability first means account for my ability, not for my disability. So I don't need a mentor that all they want to do is correct me. But I do need somebody that when I need to be corrected, will speak into that part of my life. Next, let's talk about God's love. One of my favorite quotes from the book was, the love of God must be experienced to be explained, and, and also I think it has to be experienced to be understood. Talk to us about some of the facets of God's love that you touch on in the book and how that relates to our understanding of destiny. 
I counseled for three years. I was our main counselor or one of two main counselors here at Bethel Church, which is, you know, it's a pretty large church. And so I counseled many sessions a day. And I found that most of the time, the root, root, root cause of a bad marriage or a struggle someone's going through, the root cause is they don't actually love themselves. And Jesus said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. That word as, that's a pretty big, small word. (laughs) That word as is maybe one of the most important words in the entire New Testament. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And some of the things I've learned through my own life and my experience of counseling other people is that if you don't love you, then you aren't going to love anyone else. You know, husbands love your wives as you love your own flesh. The best thing you can do for your marriage is to actually love you so that you can love her, so that you can love him. You have to love you. The second thing I learned is that when someone tries to love you more than you love yourself, you will sabotage your relationship with them because you won't let someone love you more than you love you. So lots of times in a counseling session, I would say to somebody, you know, I really feel like you don't know how much Jesus loves you. And they would quote scriptures to me. Oh, God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. They have many of the love scriptures memorized, but they've never actually experienced the love of God. And Paul said, I would that you would know the love of God that surpasses understanding. (laughs) I would that you would know the love of God that's beyond understanding. What's he saying? He's saying that you would experience what you can't explain. A lot of people can explain love. They would be like, well, love is 1 Corinthians 13. Love is kind. Love is patient. They know the facts about love, but they've actually never experienced love. And so one of the points that I make in the book is that for you to be fully alive and fully actualized and to give yourself permission to actually be everything that you're supposed to be, You actually have to experience the love of God, not just know about it. You can't just repeat facts about love and think that you know about love, because Paul said, I would that you would know through experience what you couldn't ever explain. And so I think it's important that we learn how to experience the love of God. And the book gives some really good examples and some really good tips on how do I actually come to experience the love of God. Amongst the books on the market today that promise to help you find your destiny and purpose, for you as the author, what is it that really sets Destined to Win apart? I think that a lot of self-help books are kind of works-driven. I don't actually want to speak badly about uh, anybody else's book because I think every book has something to add. But Destined to Win actually tries to get to the root of what is driving my need? What is driving my issues? What's at the root, root, root of why I'm unhappy? And so instead of just giving you some exercises on how to feel fulfilled, it actually says, have you taken good care of your heart? Do you actually understand why you behave like that when somebody says that to you? Do you really know When this thing happens in your life and you respond like that, instead of just changing your response, how about we think about why it is that you feel compelled to respond like that? So I think that one of the things that sets it apart from some books is that it actually goes after how do I actually be fully alive in the core of who I am and not just have positive expressions or accomplish something great. Those things are in the book. But how do I actually meet this desperate need I have to feel connected, to belong to something, to feel connected to other people, to know that God desperately loves me? How do I get connected? How does the inner man get totally connected to the king and his kingdom. I think that approach and practical ways of connecting really set the book apart from some books that I've read. 
Chris, if we were able to teleport you in front of every reader as they finish that last page of Destined to Win, what parting encouragement or challenge would you share with each of them? I would first of all say that Jesus actually wants you to win, that you were born to win. God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature are clearly seen in what God made. So in other words, the way God created you actually speaks not just of who you are, but who he is. And because you were made in his image and in his likeness, you actually emanate or display God's purpose and glory. Like, you actually are telling people about God by the way you behave, because when you see Jesus, it's like looking in a mirror. So you were made just like him. Your feet point forward. They don't swivel backwards. Your head doesn't swivel backwards. Your arms and hands only work forward. You only have eyes in the front of your head. You have no eye in the back of your head. The point is, is that you were not built to retreat. You were not built to go backwards. That saying, that adage that we have in America that says, oh, I took three steps forward and two steps back. You weren't made to back up. You weren't made to go backwards. You weren't made to lose. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 says, when you're in an evil day and you've done everything to stand, stand firm. In other words, on your worst day, you're created to stand, not back up. And so I would say that you were born to win. God is for you. All things work together for good in the end. So if it's not good, it's not the end. And when I'm convinced that God actually created me to win, when I'm convinced that God is actually for me, and if he's for me, then who can be against me? When I'm convinced that I have power over all the power of the enemy, and that I literally was created in the image of God, and therefore my daddy is God. When I'm convinced of those things, then fear and anxiety and low self-esteem, all those things, those things begin to vanish. They begin to dissipate like fog on a sunny day. And I really believe that people need to know that God loves them. For our final two questions, I wanted to depart from the book for just a moment. I would be curious to hear about any routines or habits. This year, I'm talking to a lot more leaders, and I'm always curious to know what contributes to their success. Do you have any morning or evening routines or daily habits that you see as a key contributor to your ongoing successes? I love to hear other people's testimonies. I love to surround myself with people that are more successful than myself. I think that I have a habit of hanging out with people that are bigger than me and asking questions. And the challenge is when you hang out with people who are more successful, it can make you feel small if you don't deal with your way that you view yourself. I think a good habit I have is I consistently, I won't say every day, but I consistently put myself in a place with people who are more successful in some area of their life than I, and I love to get insight into what made them successful. And I think it's important that we surround ourselves with wise people. Solomon said that if you stay in the presence of a fool, that you will become foolish. But an abundance of wise counselors, there's victory. So there's a great contrast. If we hang out with people that have the same weaknesses, we never get strong. But if we hang out with people who are strong where we're weak, it might make us feel uncomfortable, but it's actually one of the ways that we become successful. All right. And then our final off-book question, what about any tools or apps? I know you manage a lot of people. You're a busy guy. For some people, a Moleskine notebook might be indispensable or something like Evernote. But for you, what have you found most helpful in managing all the things that are in play in your world? The only thing that I do app-wise in any consistent way is I'm a a very out-of-the-box thinker and I get ideas on the run all the time. You know, I have an iPhone and I use the notes section of my iPhone to spontaneously make notes. I'll get up in the middle of the night like I did two nights ago. I got up in the middle of the night. The Lord gave me this whole leadership idea of how to teach what I've been teaching in individual modules. And I just woke up and in 15 minutes on my app, on my phone, on my note app, I just laid out the 16 different modules that the Lord gave me and emailed it to myself. So I would say that my wife, she's got like 400 apps on her phone. She uses like 30 of them on any given day. 
And she's always like, you need this app. You need to organize yourself like this. And I'm like, uh, I'm not a great IT guy. I just need some way to remember the things that I get spontaneously because I figured out that an hour later, I've totally forgotten most of the details. Chris, if the listeners want to find out more about you and find out more about all of your books, where should they go on the web? They should go to Chris Valentin. That's K-R-I-S-V-A-L-L-O-T-T-O-N dot org. And if you just Google my name, actually, the first thing that comes up is chrisvalentin.org. We have 200 free podcasts and webcasts there. Three times a week, we have a blog, and you can sign up for our newsletter and our stores there, so you can purchase any of our books there at a discount. Our travel schedule's there. There's quite a bit on the site. And as always, I'll make it easy for the listeners. If you just head over to seantabbitt.com when this interview goes live, I'll have links to Chris's webpage, all of his social media, so you can just click on through and access all the resources that Chris mentioned. Now it's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Chris Vallotton. Once again, our book today was Destined to Win. For more on Chris and his books, be sure to visit his website at chrisvallotton.org. You can find out more about this particular book also on the publisher's website, and that's available at thomasnelson.com. Chris, I just want to say thanks so much for sharing with us today. It's been a great pleasure speaking with you. Well, thank you so very much, man. God bless you. And that's all for this episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show. If you have a question, comment, or suggestion, you can connect with me via email using show at seantabbitt.com. Be sure to follow me on Twitter, where I go by the Twitter handle at stabbitt. And if you enjoy the show, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. Until next time, this is your host, Sean Tabbitt, signing off. Thank you.